This video looks at some of the mathematical aspects of the energy momentum tensor and how the momentum density vector can be extracted from it. It then goes on to show that matter, energy and momentum are conserved in the flat space time of special relativity. Now from the last video we found the energy momentum tensor has the form described here. Momentum density, energy flux, pressure, shear and energy density here for this single time component. Now this tensor we found to have the form this in some Lorentz frame. In a frame at rest with respect to the matter which in that case was a stream of non-interacting particles gamma would be 1 and we would just have this part here rho 0 u mu u nu. In some other frame moving with respect to the to the particle, the rest frame of the particles, then we would have this gamma squared term here. And that was all in the last video. So the momentum, energy momentum tensor took this form here. And now what we want to do is what information can we extract from it is the next bit. All right. So let's look at taking the inner product with the four velocity of an object with the energy momentum tensor. And this is the four velocity of the stream of particles. And by doing that, we can extract the uh, momentum density vector. So let's put that in here. Here's our four, u nu, these components here. These components are the four velocity we're interested in. And if we multiply that out, this matrix here, the energy momentum tensor matrix array, with this four vector here, the four velocity of the particles. And what we can find is, when we perform that operation we end up with this. This becomes the four velocity magnitude, the inner product of the four velocity with itself gives us minus c squared for the metric signature I use in these videos and that gives us here gamma squared rho zero times the four velocity u. So this and if we, if we replace the uh, energy density rho zero here with m zero n on v because remember there's n number of particles so this is the energy density uh, sorry, this is the matter density, all right, and same thing as energy density, but here is the momentum density here, m0 times u is the form momentum, and this is the matter density, n number of particles, because we had a stream of particles moving through flat space time. And that was the subject of the last video, and so we end up with a momentum density. Now, if we looked at that, in terms of components and uh, basis vectors, we'd have T dotted with U if we put the four velocity on the right and we take the inner product with the energy momentum tensor and the four velocity of the particles and write this out in component form and with the basis vectors. And here we have the tensor product, it's cross symbol here. And on the right here is our four velocity of our particles, U alpha, E alpha, and here we'll form the next line down the inner basis. E contravariant nu with E covariant alpha. When we do that, Konica delta applies across those two. And we're left with a an object that has a single basis vector, so it's a it's a vector. And if we look here when alpha is equal to nu, this becomes nu, nu here, and then we have an object with upper component mu, basis vector, covariant basis vector mu, tangent basis vectors mu and this object here writing these components out and with the four velocity here gives us the momentum density vector and this is a momentum density vector in the tangent basis e contravariant e covariant sorry mu basis vector now if we take the inner product of the four velocity on the left there putting it on the left this time instead of the right as over here <coughs> performing the same operations again we're going to end up here with, again, the Kronecker delta applies across here. Same operation, we're just performing on the other side. When we do that, notice though that here, when uh, uh, nu is equal to alpha, uh, or I should say alpha equal to nu, this becomes nu, this nu, nu. And when we do that, we end up with these components here, covariant components, with the contravariant basis, or the cotangent basis the dual basis, if you like. These uh, combined, this is all a one form, E in the cotangent basis, 
this here and these up here. These form a one form and we can express the vector in the tangent basis or in the cotangent basis. Either way it's the same vector because any vector can be expressed in the covariant or tangent basis or the contravariant basis or cotangent basis or the dual basis. Either all of those words the same thing. Alright, uh, so let's do, in the latter case, um, for the um, covariant components, these one forms here, we use a row vector, whereas in the last case we had a um, column vector on the right here, now we use a row vector here. That operation means we must, uh, in terms of matrix multiplication, we have a one row by four column, four by four column, and that will give us a one by four object. So when we perform that operation here, do this matrix multiplication operations here, row vector with the four by four matrix. If you look at these terms here, if you work your way through here, you'll find each of these comma, 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 and there's four of them there. When you sum them, u0, u0, ux, ux, uy, uy, uz, uz, and when you sum those, you'll get just factor those out because this will come down to being minus c squared again and we produce a row vector down here just as we expected and this is a momentum density in the other basis in the contravariant basis or the cotangent basis or the dual basis so that the components are covariant lower index all right, next bit. So coming back, so we had our stream of particles moving through flat Minkowski space. Here they are non-interacting particles, and we can imagine some box of arbitrary volume uh, with uh, <coughs> lengths delta x, delta y, delta z, and these we've got this in standard configuration where the particles are moving along parallel to the x-axis, um, and we have the front of the box here where particles are passing through in the direction of the x basis vector, basis vector in the x direction, and coming from the face behind that in the opposite direction uh, in the minus ex direction. Now the number density vector is given by n, as we found in the last video, n number of particles over the volume v to give their density times the four velocity, which we could also write that as n contravariant zero and this spatial number density vector here. Now component forms, n is n mu e mu in the covariant or tangent basis, and the components n mu are n on v gamma times c for the, which is the number density component, n zero number density component, this one here, this is the straight number density, and then the spatial flux of particles here, n on v times gamma, ux, uy, uz. All right, now conservation of number density requires that the divergence of the number density four vector should be zero. We don't expect that anywhere in Minkowski space, as these particles move along, we don't expect there to be a source of particles or a sink of particles. So at any time we care to look, there should be the same number of particles. It shouldn't change over time. All right. So, But we can use Gauss's law to see if how that that is the case so the divergence then is written as in component form dn mu on dx mu is this object here the time part and then plus the spatial part here and all that's equal to zero now just in general gauss's law expressed by here is the volume integral here of the divergence over the four volume this bit here and in our case we're in flat minkowski space so our metric will be eta and the, it's then equal to a surface integral over a, a dimension less over some three-dimensional surface in this case here over the boundary of the space we're interested in. In our case then, so applying Gauss's law here, we have the integral dv uh, dn0 on dt dv plus the volume, the spatial divergence, this part here, which we'll be particularly interested in, and is equal to this. We can take the partial derivative sign outside the integral, and so that we have the integral over a volume of the uh, number density, dv, and then we have the surface integral over some appropriate surface, which in this case will be going down from three dimensions here to two dimensions, right, because it'll be over a some sort of spatial surface, which in this case will be our box here, each face here, will be a two-dimensional surface. 
And because we're applying the divergence theorem over the spatial part, over this spatial part here. All right. Not forgetting there's also this term here. Okay, so let's have a look at the spatial part. So we've got this flux of particles, this uh, stream of non-interacting particles, a swarm of particles. They're moving along the X direction, not in the Y or Z directions. They're all moving uh, standard configuration, if you like, along the X axis. And you have a box here, and the box can be of arbitrary size. We're interested in the flux across the box across the face of each of the blocks, uh, box, sorry, and we're interested in the divergence. Inside that box, we don't expect there to be any particles created or any particles lost. So there's no source or sink in there. Um, and we're looking, the particles pass through the rear side of the box over here, which you can't see, but facing away from you, and passes through the front of the box here as you're looking at it uh, in the direction of the basis vector EX. Okay, so let's have a look at that then. So let's evaluate this integral over the surface. And the only two surfaces we need to concern about are the rear part there and the front part. There's no motion in the Y or Z directions. It's in standard configuration. Now, in the rear part, you have negative EX. N dotted with that. That's the normal vector to that surface. N hat is a normal vector here, a unit normal vector, hence the hat on it or the caret. And for the front part here, the flux across this surface here, you have N dotted with EX, particles moving outwards, um, as opposed to here where they were moving inwards. Um, so the flux is inwards, hence the negative EX there. And here it's outwards plus EX. And the area to integrate over is dy, dz, two dimensions here. And we find that this is the negative of this, they cancel out, so that this spatial integral here of the flux across these two surfaces in when summed is zero. Okay, so where does that leave us? All right, well, in flat space, we can add vectors at different spatial locations because the basis vectors of flat space are constant everywhere. So on the previous slide, that addition, the one vector pointing in the opposite direction of the other, both multiplied by the same flux, no particles are created or lost. Uh, and given, even though they're separated spatially across the x direction here, we can still add them because the basis vectors are the same all across this space. So we can simply add vectors. That comes with flat Euclidean geometry. So Minkowski in this space is Euclidean space plus time. And the space time interval between any two events is independent of the inertial frame of reference in which they are recorded. So all observers can add or subtract vectors in this space here. And all observers can use the same standard basis vectors which means they can all add and subtract uh, vectors in this space. All that will change is the components will be multiplied gamma factor or otherwise, depending on which reference frame they're in. All right, so we have ddt, the integral over v of n0 dv is equal to zero, because remember all the spatial part disappeared. So what happens here now? n0 is a number density, and that gives us that the ddt of the integral v n0 dv is ddt of that integral v n over v gamma c dv. Okay, well, integrating that over v, n number of particles per unit volume, integrated over the volume, so we're just going to have the volume will sum out there. We're left with ddt is n gamma c. Now, c is a constant, and gamma, given the particles move at a constant uh, uh, speed, then for the Lorentz observer in some other frame, that gamma will have a fixed number. So again, that's a constant for any other observer in some other reference frame. Um, for an observer at rest with the particles, gamma will be 1. And so we'll have, we're left over just n is equal to a constant. Now that's exactly what we expected to find. And I'm just going through the process to show that that is the case. There's no source or sink there for particles. No particles are lost. No particles are gained. So in flat Minkowski space, an object at rest or moving with a constant velocity, according to some observer, will continue to do so unless acted upon by some outside force. And we found the momentum density of our swarm of particles is given by this object here in the tangent basis with components these, or can be written in this form. Um, sorry about that slight abusive notation there because really this is a vector here, but um, just if I can use that a little bit, if no one minds too much, we can do it that way. All right, next bit. So for conservation of momentum density, we expect that the divergence 
of the momentum density to be zero. So this is object here. We expect this to be zero in Minkowski space. Remember, we're only in Minkowski space here. There's no curved spaces at the moment. That's the next video. And we get this object here. If we write out divergence, we have dp, zero dt, del dot p again, the spatial part. Okay, applying Gauss's law to determine whether or not momentum is conserved. Here's this object here. Put these constants out front. And we have this object here, the divergence. Okay, so we have these constants multiplied by the integral of dp, zero dt over the, um, over the volume, spatial volume that is, and plus the constants over this part here, the spatial volume. We're going to integrate that over. Okay, and that will give us, next line down, is this bit here, doesn't change, and we're, now we've reduced this divergence over the spatial volume to a flux over a surface. We're going to integrate over that. And um, just coming down here now, if we look, so if all this is zero, then we can say that this object here is equal to the minus of this object here. In other words, if all of this is equal to zero, then this plus this equals zero. And we can take uh, this on the other side, this part here on the other side, as we have done here, and that'll be equal to the negative of all this. All right, next bit, remember, and we're interested now in the spatial momentum um, uh, dotted with the normal to the surface, and we're going to sum this over all the surfaces. Okay, so this bit here is now this momentum density through this face, which is that one there, sorry, plus EX, this one here. And this here, negative, because that points in a negative direction. That's the flux over that surface. Okay, so this bit, momentum density dotted with the negative EX, then integrated over dy, dz. And this bit here, integrated over the, this face here, this positive face here. Remember, there's no motion in the y or z direction, so we don't have to worry about that. The flux is over those faces. And uh, this bit here, so this is all equal to zero, and we can see that because this part here is identical to this part here. These basis vectors are the same, just they differ in direction, 180 degrees in direction. We're in flat Minkowski space. We can add vectors at different points of this Minkowski space-time manifold. And so this bit can all go to zero. When we do that, we just left them with this bit here, integrated over a volume, over a spatial volume dV. N over V, all of this, when we integrate that, we're left with just this bit here. D dt of that is zero. And that implies that the P0 component of the form momentum is constant. And so that shows that momentum is conserved. We found all of this uh, to be zero here. So we found momentum is concerned. But now we're going to look at this bit here, which is the energy component of the momentum. We say that P0 is E on C is constant. And so we see that the energy is also conserved. So we found here through the use, this divergence here is actually equal to zero. DDT of all this will go to zero. Um, and so the, the divergence of the momentum density over the space is zero. And so that means that the momentum is conserved, momentum density is conserved. And here we found that P0 is E on C is constant, so the energy is conserved as well. All right, so in special relativity, we can see that momentum and energy are conserved, and this conservation is expressed as del dot t is equal to zero, or in component form, dt mu nu over dx nu is zero. Notice that this component lines up with that one because we're not doing the general derivative, we're doing the derivative with respect to each of the coordinates, as is the case. Del t is a different operation to del dot t. Del dot t is the divergence, and that's where this derivative underneath here will match one of the indices up here. So there's going to be four of them. Okay. A general derivative, del t, would be this will be a different index down here to these two. All right, so that's equal to zero. And curved space time will find that this result is not true.